Welcome to the Tales of American History, the Witnessing History Education Foundation podcast, educating Americans to understand the history of their country and of other countries so that they will appreciate the value of America's unique free institutions. Join us at witnessinghistory.org, the website of the Witnessing History Education Foundation. Subscribe to our lively and informative newsletter. View for free the Foundation's documentary films on the website and on the Foundation's new YouTube platform. Review the Foundation's free teacher education materials that conform to grade-level education standards at pbslearning.org. Follow Witnessing History on Facebook and Twitter. And consider making a tax-deductible gift in any amount to support the work of our Foundation. Now, take a journey back through time with Kent Masterson Brown and his guest, and let their storytelling transport you to the most compelling moments in American history. Today, Kent's guest is Dr. Amy Merle Taylor, professor of history at the University of Kentucky, where she's been honored with a great teacher award from the UK Alumni Association. Dr. Taylor's research interests are in the area of the Civil War and Reconstruction in the South. Her recent book, Embattled Freedom, Journeys Through the Civil War's Slave Refugee Camps, was published in 2018 by UNC Press and has won many national awards, including the Frederick Douglass Prize from Yale University, the Avery Craven Prize for Civil War History, and the Merle Curti Prize for U.S. Social History from the Organization of American Historians. Dr. Taylor will discuss with Kent the fascinating stories of the legal ambiguities surrounding slaves during the Civil War, especially in Union-occupied Central Kentucky. Welcome, Dr. Taylor. Amy, welcome. Thank you. It's wonderful um, having you. Um, It's great to be here. Well, it's great having you. Uh, Before we get into all the, the stuff we want to talk about, um, you were you're a native of Rockville, Maryland. Is yes, that right? that's correct. And uh, went to uh, Duke University. Uh huh. And you uh, got a your bachelor's in history there. I did. And then I understand you work for a congressman after that. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I yeah. I had some. What, what, what possessed you? To, I know. No, I'm I know. So I I grew up in Maryland. I grew up in a suburb of Washington yeah, D.C. Yeah. And when you grow up right by the nation's capital, you get oh, kind yeah. of fired up about politics. Oh. And so oh, yeah. I thought I had a political future. Yeah. And so yeah. I did some internships. I went and worked in Washington, and then. It didn't take long to realize it wasn't for me. I got a little disillusioned. I had a great boss, but I, um, it just was not, not for me. I wanted to think for myself and instead of working for a member of Congress and always thinking you've for them. You've been quoted as saying that before. Oh, have I? <laughs> yes, you have. I even have it written down. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I, mean, I wanted to think for myself rather than for my boss. Well, that's. I mean, that's what it was. When you work for these members of Congress, you're always having to to, well, what would he want to do? What should he do? You know? Yeah. And, yeah, um, and I had yeah. studied, obviously studied history and I found myself, uh, just dying to get back into the archives yeah. and do some work for myself. I tell so. you what, I know the feeling, uh, for 46 years, I, um, I practiced law uh-huh. and, uh, I got a degree in history from my undergraduate school and uh, mm. all those professors all told me they wanted me to go to graduate school and all this stuff. And I, I wanted to be a lawyer, you know, uh-huh. and I enjoyed practicing law mm-hmm. um, as much as anyone can enjoy practicing law. <laughs> <laughs> but I can, I can, I have great empathy here because mm-hmm. all through my law practice, you know, I dabble in history uh-huh. and uh, write a book or, and then ultimately I got into making films, but um it was all during that career, and it was like this thing is constantly drawing me yep. there. Mm-hmm. And I know that feeling. Yes, history work is great fun, and it's and, fun, and it's still mysterious, and there's so yeah. much to learn and to know. Right, that's what pulled me back. Right. And yeah. you come across something that no one's touched before, yes. and it's it's a dream. It's, it's magical. A, it's one, yeah. It is magical. Mm-hmm. It really is. Mm-hmm. Well, you've. Um, 
you've written some wonderful, wonderful stuff. And Thank you. this embattled freedom uh, is the creme de la creme. I mean, oh, and, that's very kind of you. And you've gotten terrific reviews. And of course, uh, the awards you've gotten are mm-hmm. all so deserving in it. Uh, not, no one's ever approached that subject. Mm-hmm. And here's a case where you found this information and, yeah. what, 10 years it took you to, it did. to find this? It did. Um, what I'd like to do today is um, talk a little bit about uh, the situation of slaves. Mm-hmm. Um, on the uh, eve of the Civil War, I think the uh, 1860 census says we had like 4 million mm-hmm. Close in, to it. Uh, in, mm-hmm. in the slave-owning states. Which is a staggering number. It is. Mm -hmm. Uh, Which, of course, even when one considers, well, you know, why don't they free them? Mm -hmm. How? You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's Mm -hmm. just how do you do that? And And, that's the question they asked. It is. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and, um, no one could come up with an answer Mm -hmm. for it. Yeah. Um, And in so many ways, you know, reading that, you have a, a sense of, you do have a, a heavy heart, so to speak, for mm-hmm. the people who mm-hmm. were trapped in that. Right. Both white and black. Mm-hmm. Uh, because there's just no answer to it. Mm-hmm. But in terms of um, of the war, and there's no question about it being the underpinning uh-huh. of what became the bloodiest conflict right. this nation's ever fought. Um. You you reference uh, one episode that is a great place to start on this, mm-hmm. and that's when you got three slaves. Uh, is it Frank Baker? Is that one and of them? Shepherd Mallory, Shepherd Mallory, James Townsend, and James Townsend, mm-hmm. who uh, have been um, uh, sent into Confederate service. Mm-hmm. As um, I've written, and we both publish at Chapel Hill, and uh-huh. in my retreat book, I came across a lot of instances where slaves were uh, taken off of farms in the South by the quartermasters, mm-hmm. and the slave owner was paid, uh-huh. uh, but the slave yeah. worked. Yeah. Um, and these appear to be those kind of, mm-hmm. these three. Mm-hmm. And... Um, uh, they were working on gun emplacements and mm-hmm. so forth for the 115th Virginia mm-hmm. Militia. Mm-hmm. Uh, Virginia had a lot of militia units yeah. on the eve of the war. And um, they go across to Fort Monroe. They escape mm-hmm. and go mm-hmm. across to Fort Monroe. And there's General Benjamin Butler, as the New Orleanians would call later on Beast, Beast Butler. Butler. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> From Massachusetts. He's a colorful figure. Oh, he's an incredibly colorful figure. A heavy, rotund, uh-huh. kind of nasty-looking guy. Eyes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but a Democrat. Uh-huh. You know, and so— you And know, not anti-slavery, necessarily. No, 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 which, yeah. of course, every one of the candidates running in the 1860 election on the Democrat, <laughs> whatever branch they were, were, mm-hmm. were, were, were not for their freedom now. Right. And he was a Democrat, and of course Lincoln brings him into the service for mm-hmm. obvious political reasons. Uh-huh. But here they show up uh-huh. and uh, 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 ask for mm-hmm. sanctuary. Mm-hmm. And um, Butler, first of all, just kind of tells him to get out, get mm-hmm. back. Mm-hmm. And then uh, a flag of truce comes across from. Uh, an officer, uh, Major Cabell, I think his name was. Carey? Uh, Ca- I mean, C- Carey. Yes. Carey, which is uh-huh. a big name in Virginia. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. C-A-R-Y. 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 Yep. And um, uh, he's, he then poses to Butler under what authority, you know, are you key? Are you, what, are you, what are your intentions, so to mm-hmm. speak? And Butler says to keep them. Mm-hmm. He sees they want them. Now he's going to keep them, which yeah. is perfect. This is exactly like Butler would have been. Yeah. Yep. And then the, the the question got to, well, you know, doesn't your laws require you to get send them back? Mm-hmm. And Butler says, why does that bother you? You've seceded from the union. Right. Federal law doesn't apply to you anymore. So, <laughs> so, so, what is ultimately Butler keeps them? 
Mm-hmm. And I mean, I mean, by the end of the war, Fort Monroe has like 10,000 slaves living yeah. in and around that and I, property. Right. And I think it's even <clears throat> more. They're kind of coming and going. So yeah. the total is even greater, I think. But yeah, yeah, lots of people. And and the 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 the, the thing that I want to explore with you is, mm-hmm. it one what 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 is the status of these slaves that have come across to Butler? Uh, oh. In Lincoln's first inaugural, this is March 1861. Five states have already seceded from the Union: mm-hmm. uh, South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Georgia, and Texas. And he says, I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. He also has been adamant Mm -hmm. that the states have no right to secede. Uh And he would not recognize their secession. Mm -hmm. So in answer to uh, the Confederates' questions about these Mm-hmm. Runaways. Mm-hmm. Um, the state isn't seceded. Right. So federal law should apply. <laughs> so federal right? law should apply. Right. That's right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what do you think so, about all that? So this is a very messy legal situation. <laughs> and I understand a... I'm talking to an attorney about the law, which makes me slightly nervous. But <laughs> No, fire away. I mean, this is anybody's game, you know. <laughs> um, so what is their status and what's going on? Well, the, I mean, the short answer is it's just not clear cut and it depends yeah. on who you ask. Yeah, exactly. So Butler takes – and it's kind of surprising, but he takes – um, a different view, obviously, mm-hmm. than in what Lincoln was basically saying there. Yes. Um, I think his his words were something like, Virginia claims to be a foreign nation and I will take her at her word. Right. I take so her at her word. That's so right. he is accepting right. secession. Right. Um, right. So a little bit different from Lincoln there. It, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's what enables him to abandon federal law. And the federal law, of course— is not just a provision in the Constitution, but the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law law. that has empowered the federal government and federal government agents to send runaway slaves back to their owners. So Butler's basically saying, no longer applies. We can help runaway slaves now. Um, But not everybody interpreted things that way for the reasons, one of the reasons you say Mm -hmm. there. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, others just still didn't understand what sort of constitutional authority the federal government could claim, Mm -hmm. you know, to harbor runaway slaves. Right. Um, Right. You know, this is violating people's property rights. Right. Right. Um, And then the other the other thing is as a military officer, mm -hmm. uh, Butler, um, he has an enemy over there mm-hmm. from which these slaves came. Mm-hmm. And um, that enemy uh, regards those slaves as property. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> right. And, uh, and that's the thing. Butler, he's a union man. He might union. not be anti-slavery, but he's he's, he's a union. union man. Yes, he is. <laughs> yeah, he is. He so is. he's going to go after the enemy. Heck, uh, not res- Lincoln put some stars on his shoulders. I mean, yeah. that, uh, that, yeah. and that made him something, yeah. something special. <laughs> and I think what's interesting is that on that point, you know, Butler had been in Maryland just mm-hmm. a week or two before he gets to Fort Monroe. Yeah. And there he was sending slaves back to their owners. Yeah. Because yeah. those owners he deemed loyal. loyal. They were union. Right. Yeah. So right. it's it's all about union Confederate loyalty. That's what makes – in in Butler's mind, that's why this is all clear cut. Well, it, and, and frankly, his response there is very clear cut, mm-hmm. and it's also very understandable. Mm-hmm. If you're not in in rebellion, mm-hmm. then sure, they're yours. Yeah. If you are in rebellion, mm-hmm. then particularly for the male slaves, uh-huh. uh, you're using them mm-hmm. in an effort to combat me. Right. And so uh, I regard those as property. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and subject to being seized, mm-hmm. um, and or if they come into my lines, being held. Mm-hmm. It, de- it denies you right. the opportunity to build more embattlements exactly. to, 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 to hurt me. Yes. So uh, on those two, uh, not only the law level, mm-hmm. but then just the military level of, right. of, of how do you wage war, mm-hmm. um, yeah, you've well, got two different answers. Well, Butler's starting— 
in a way, we can see in retrospect, he's sort of building the case that interfering with slavery is military necessity, Mm -hmm. that this is going to serve the interests of the military. That's right. And of course, we'll see that argument really develop and really get expressed in the Emancipation Proclamation eventually. Well, you know, as you know, as you write, uh, after that, uh, eight more slaves came into Mm -hmm. his his Butler's camp. And they keep coming. And then 47 Mm come. And now they're not only men, but they're women and children. And the question now goes, uh, <laughs> right. what now? Right. What is their status? Right. That, that's really interesting because when Butler first issues his order and is explaining to Washington what mm-hmm. he's doing, you know, it's a lot about military necessity, right. about depriving the Confederacy of this labor and adding to the unions. Right. But that argument is more easily made for men. Yeah. And so the understanding on the union side was that this was just going to affect men. Mm-hmm. But then the women and children keep coming and right. they keep coming and they keep coming. And Butler himself starts to get kind of torn up about this. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can see in some of his writing that he really seems to agonize. He doesn't want to send these women and children back and separate these families. Yeah. So he sort of realizes – He's now into a situation that's a little more complicated (laughs) than he originally bargained for. Um, And there, basically, what he does is he allows them to stay, even though it kind of undermines or contradicts Mm -hmm. his original reasoning. Mm -hmm. You know, by his original reasoning, they shouldn't be there. But he allows them to stay. Yeah. And then in the midst of all this, Uh uh, General Irvin McDowell. Mm-hmm. who oh. commands the Department of Northeastern Virginia, Yeah, issues an order um, to his, all his uh, commanders that runaway slaves who come into Union lines should be turned away. Yes. Now, you know, Irvin McDowell has Kentucky roots. I did. Oh. He is the son of Samuel McDowell from Danville and his wife, Mary Irvin who also was a Kentuckian. You know, I didn't know that, but as soon as you said it, those names are Kentucky names. Absolutely. Wow. And Samuel McDowell, who is the son of the great Samuel McDowell, who was the chairman of Kentucky's first constitutional convention. Uh-huh. And they all came from Rockbridge County, Virginia. And um, uh, Ephraim McDowell mm-hmm. is Samuel's brother. Wow, okay. The surgeon, the uh-huh. famous surgeon. Sure. So here's and, – and these were people who were slave owners. Mm-hmm. Um, they weren't great slave owners, but they did have sizable farms in Boyle County. And then uh, uh, Samuel and Mary Irvin moved to what's now Columbus, Ohio, and that's where Irvin was born, General Irvin McDowell. Okay. So he comes from that uh-huh. background. Uh-huh. And uh, here he now issues this order about runaway slaves must be turned away, Mm -hmm. which, of course, would be repeated off and on through the war by commanders. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, finally, as I understand from your your man, the Secretary of War, Simon Cameron, then Mm -hmm. interfered Uh and uh, agreed that Butler could keep his runaway slaves in right. spite of McDowell's order. Right. But Butler <clears throat> Butler was pretty upset about McDowell. Yeah. Um, and he starts getting upset at other times when he senses that other others in the union are not following his precedent. Right. And and when his superiors are allowing them to not follow his right. precedent. Right. And there I think we see Butler is not just a military man, but as a political man. Yeah. Yeah. And you sense from his writings that he he wants to be a leader on mm-hmm. this very political question of slavery. Mm-hmm. And he's starting to stake out some ground. He's getting absolutely praised by abolitionists. Yeah. I mean, at the Library of Congress, you look at his correspondence that's there. I mean, the letters that come in from all over the North, they are just praising him like he is just the greatest yeah. human being. Yeah. And, of course, they <laughs> populate planet. Massachusetts. <laughs> yes, yes. And um, there was – there's a letter later in the war from his wife. His correspondence between Butler and um, his wife are very interesting. 
And she at one point tells him, you know, make sure you stay on the right side of the emancipation question Mm -hmm. if you have any ambitions. Yeah, it didn't end up in my book. But um, so he's making some calculations Mm -hmm. about his future political career, I think. Yeah. And emancipation is now part of it. So I think that's part of what's going on when he gets upset about other people not following him. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, uh, just keeping moving forward on that, I mean, McDowell's ultimately defeated in the field Mm -hmm. by uh, Mm -hmm. P.G.T. Beauregard and Joseph E. Johnston at First Manassas. Yeah. And and it's a bitter defeat Mm -hmm. uh, route, Mm -hmm. frankly. And with that, um, uh, that affects... The, posi- the the fortresses, the positions along the Virginia coast. Yes. To the extent now where these three are in danger of being captured mm-hmm. by Confederate forces. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. So the Union starts pulling some of their men out, out. of right. you know the the whole peninsula area where yeah. they had they had been expanding into Newport News and so forth, and now right. they're pulling them out and sending mm-hmm. them to Washington. Right. And right. that causes a great deal of chaos because yeah. um, there are hundreds of people who have fled to union lines and now they have less protection. That's right. That's right. And yeah. for people who don't recall, the uh, Fort Monroe mm. is at the foot of the Great Peninsula yes. that is between the York and the James River. Yeah. Empties into the uh, Hampton Roads. and mm-hmm. uh, Yeah. Um, uh, and um, uh, so – yeah, and and when when all those coastal defenses are contracted because mm-hmm. of that defeat, mm-hmm. um, now they're subject to being enslaved again. Mm-hmm. Yes, <laughs> yes, they're very incredibly and, vulnerable, and, 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 could, and could be really are. harmed. Yeah, yeah, because they, they escape, and some are, but then the rest they they identify the one secure place is Fort Monroe inside the fort itself. Yeah, inside its walls. Yeah, and so huge. <laughs> we see this huge flood of people leaving Newport yeah. News and Hampton and going into the fort. And apparently it was such a scene that artists from Harper's Weekly and Frank Leslie's Illustrated News mm-hmm. were there and they 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 drew, uh, they sketched what they saw. And we see, we have those um, images today yeah. that give us yeah. a sense of just this mass um, yeah. sort of exodus into the fort to yeah. find protection. Well, and you know, uh, first Manassas was fought on the twenty first, bull, first mm-hmm. Bull Run on the twenty first of July, eighteen sixty one, and in August, uh, Congress passes the first Confiscation Act, mm-hmm. in eighteen sixty one, and um, it allows the uh, confiscation of any property used to support the Confederate cause, right, uh, as contraband of war. And uh, Senator Lyman Trumbull, mm-hmm. uh, who a confidant of Abraham Lincoln's from Illinois, mm-hmm. great supporter of Lincoln in, in Illinois, yeah. frankly, s- secured for him his the, fr- the nomination for the United States Senate mm-hmm. and then helped secure for him the nomination to the – as president on the Republican uh-huh. Party uh, ticket in 1860. Uh, he says that this also uh, enslaved people. Were, would be considered contraband mm-hmm. um, of war for purposes of the Confiscation Act. Mm-hmm. So now you have this mm-hmm. suddenly um, yeah. on the scene. Yeah. So Butler's order has influenced federal yeah. policy on a much bigger scale. On a bigger scale. Yeah. yeah. And Butler yeah. himself expresses a little frustration because um, he, by this time, is allowing – women and children in. Yeah. But the way the Confiscation Act is worded, it's yeah. more his strict original yeah. language and yeah. it's not going to. So, But still, it is generally understood as Butler's order now, yeah. um, you know, the law of the union across the board. You know, it's, it's interesting, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Amy. I, I've never heard uh, a discussion that had a, uh, a favorable side 
uh, to Ben Butler. <laughs> 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 and, yeah. and, and, we're, yeah. and we're now in the midst yeah. of one. <laughs> yeah. It's usually like, oh, that skunk. I mean, yeah. uh, but I uh, think we, we need a new biography. We, of him you or really kind of do. And I yeah. tell you what, I thought about that in looking at your work that, yeah. uh, you know, maybe Ben Butler needs to be reappraised here. I think so. I think so. And I think he's. Um, it's not simply a matter of, oh, he was better than we thought. Yeah. Um, I think he was just more complicated and constantly changing. And yeah. I think he probably actually reflects the way a lot of people were thinking on the union side. I do, too. Um, so, I do, too. So it won't be me working on it. Maybe you I should write it. No. <laughs> 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 but please. <laughs> well, you know, uh, uh, forward, uh, f- moving a little bit farther forward, um, we have a, um, a another act in March of 1862 oh, yeah. uh, where um, officers were prohibited from then employing any of their forces for the purpose of returning fugitives. Right. It's an act of Congress. Yeah, a new article of war. I mean, it's um, a really – we don't have a, a nice name for it. Like no, the Confiscation no, Act or the no Contraband name. Order. It's, yeah. it's got no fancy name in our history. And it's kind of been sort of buried. Yeah. And I've only seen a few historians here and there who mention it. You're the but, first one I've ever read who mentioned it. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. I mean, I've never heard of it. Before. Yeah. I mean, I hadn't heard much. and But in going through uh, military records and the writings of some of these commanders in local places, that's what they were listening to. Yeah. Yeah. And they felt very constrained by it. Now, mm-hmm. there were always those who didn't listen and, you know, yeah. any yeah. sort of policy is going to be thwarted by some people. But that one exerted quite a bit of influence yeah. um, and led more and more army officials to stop turning uh, runaways back. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. the, the punishment anybody caught was uh, oh, oh, court martial and dismissal yeah. from the service. So, yeah. I mean, that's a pretty harsh punishment. It's, yeah, it really is. Yeah. That's the end. So, for... you can see why it had some force over people. And then, you know, besides Ben Butler, uh, uh, which who's in Virginia at the time, mm-hmm. you've got uh, a man Lincoln named as a commander of the Department of the West. Mm hmm. Uh, that included all the territory between Mississippi and the river and the yeah. Rocky Mountains, I, probably farther than that. Uh-huh. But um, he appointed him commander of that, and Fremont establishes his headquarters in St. Louis. Mm-hmm. St. Louis, Missouri's a mess. Yeah. Missouri oh. is like, uh, well, it may be worse at that moment than Kentucky. That's that's interesting. Maybe so. Mm-hmm. They rival each other. They do rival each other. <laughs> Well, you know, I remember reading in, in when uh, Morgan, John Hunt Morgan here from uh-huh. Lexington, uh, sent, takes all of his Lexington rifles down to Munfordville. Mm. And they actually go across the Green River to Woodsonville. And that's where they're all sworn into service. And who shows up? But um, uh, Morgan's brother-in-law, Basil Duke, oh. who had been practicing law in St. Louis. And uh, was caught, uh, well, it was never caught, but was accused of burning bridges. I mean, it was absolutely mm-hmm. a, a civil war within the state that was mm-hmm. erupting. Yeah. And um, so Lincoln thinks that uh, John C. Fremont mm-hmm. can take care of that. Um, who, by the way, is one of the people he defeated for the Republican nomination in 1860. <laughs> <laughs> but he built a team of rivals, right? Yeah. So he, right. he pulls them in. <laughs> well, he declares martial law uh, as early as August 1861. So this is this yeah. is the same time as yeah. as Butler and and mm-hmm. the three fugitives. Um, and in that, with and he declares martial law, and he says in his orders that property of all persons, real and personal who take up arms against the United States, uh, is declared confiscated and their uh, stores um, uh, and their slaves freed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's free and slave. So he went further than Butler. Yeah. Yeah. Or attempted to. Attempted to. Yeah. He, of course, this, here's Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Uh, What do you think Lincoln was doing at all this time with, with, (laughs) with, with, with this guy, particularly Fremont? Well, I mean, he stops Fremont from doing this. Um, so whereas Lincoln sort of quietly 
approves of what Butler has done. He doesn't yeah. try to stop Butler in Virginia. Yeah. Yeah. He stops Fremont from doing something similar, although even more extreme, yeah. by freeing yeah. them in Missouri. And I mean, there, you know, he's Lincoln's very attuned to local politics yeah. um, and the differences of one place to the other. And, yeah. you know, Missouri's a loyal state. Yeah. So, you know, he can't have, um, he can't go in there and be interfering with slavery in this loyal union state. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so Fremont's act can't stand yeah. uh, in his view. And, you know, it's interesting, Fremont issues this, and who does Lincoln get a letter from about it, but from Joshua Speed. Oh. <laughs> from Louisville. Uh-huh. Who... I mean, his he he roomed with Joshua yeah, Speed in yeah. Springfield when he first started practicing law. Speed was a merchant, mm-hmm. um, and uh, he later left Springfield, came back to Louisville, and Lincoln would visit him at Farmington here in in, oh. in Louisville. Oh wow! And he, particularly after he broke off his engagement with Mary Todd, <laughs> he, he, uh-huh. he needed some help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need a little support. Yeah. So Joshua Speed was just the bosom pal mm-hmm. to Lincoln, mm-hmm. and he. Uh, I scribbled a, a, a portion of the letter. He goes, "I have seen Fremont's proclamation." This is Speed writing to Lincoln. Mm-hmm. It will hurt us in Kentucky. Now, that's a big thing for to say to Lincoln. Yeah. Because, I mean, Lincoln would boast, I'm a Kentuckian too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he says, if a military commander can turn them loose by the thousands, by mere proclamation, mm-hmm. it will be a most difficult matter to get our people to submit to it. Yeah. Yeah. He's fearing insurrection. Yeah. That yeah. kind of trouble. Because when word gets out of Missouri— of what is going on there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Think about what could happen in Kentucky. Yeah. 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 So you, you think it mm-hmm. uh, by March 1862. Mm-hmm. So where do we stand? Where does where does the slave stand? The the runaway slave, the escape. They're slave. in they're still in a very sort of murky, nebulous position. Yeah. It's um they are not free. Mm-hmm. They might be contraband in mm-hmm. some places and in mm-hmm. union lines, but they're not free. They've yeah. gotten no reassurance yeah. that freedom might come. Yeah. Um, and then it depends very much on where they are, yeah. whether they can even get into that murky contraband position, yeah. Yeah. you know. Um, but don't be in a place like Kentucky or Missouri. Yeah. You know, you've got to yeah. leave those states yeah. if you want to have any chance of getting in union yeah. lines. I, I hope so it, it's a very it's a very difficult position. And the enslaved people themselves or your you know, freedom seeking, whatever we want to call mm-hmm. them at this point, mm-hmm. um, they, you know, have to really learn the landscape of the politics and the military situation. And I, I'm pretty amazed at how some seem to really um, learn that get and it. get information, yeah. you know, yeah. even though yeah. some are trying to keep that information from them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what is interesting, and by the way, again, I mean, I've gotten into this stuff because of of your work. I mean, uh-huh. it's really wonderful stuff. Oh, thank you. And um, come September 1862, mm-hmm. yeah. after the Battle of Antietam, mm-hmm. uh, Lincoln issues the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. Mm-hmm. Now, tell the listeners really what that says. What What does the emancipation do? Yeah. So the proclamation is going to uh, declare free um, enslaved people who are in regions that are in rebellion against the Union. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it really kind of continues Mm -hmm. what the Union policy has already been doing, which is distinguish one place from another, a rebellious place versus a loyal place. Um, But but the, the real significance here is that it makes clear that even those that those who get inside union lines can now be assured that the union is on the side of freedom, that mm-hmm. that's what's going to result mm-hmm. um, with union victory in this war. Mm-hmm. So it does bring a little bit of clarity, mm-hmm. but it's still there's it maintains this distinction, this geographic yeah. distinction between rebellious and loyal yeah. places. And of course, Kentucky was not technically in rebellion, right. And so the slaves living in Kentucky were not included in that. Right. 
Missouri was technically, mm-hmm. <laughs> they were in rebellion with themselves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then so so was Kentucky. Uh-huh. I mean, um, and Maryland, Maryland and Delaware. I, in, in Delaware, degree. yep. And Tennessee. Tennessee, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And around New Orleans, some of the parishes there, yeah. and then some of the counties, um, including Hampton and Fort Monroe, Virginia, yeah, yeah. which is kind of ironic. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 that's the one thing a lot, of, a lot of folks don't realize how detailed that Emancipation Proclamation was yes. with respect to where it applies and where yes. it does not. Yeah. If you read, and I can't remember which paragraph it is, but it lists... You know, it includes all these regions except, or maybe somehow it distinguishes by county, and it lists names of all these Virginia counties, and it lists names of all these parishes in Louisiana. And um, what I love is, um, you know, a portrait that Francis Carpenter did of Lincoln going over the Emancipation Proclamation with with his cabinet. And if you look over to the side, there's this map (laughs) that's just kind of lying there in the room. Uh And it's actually a map of the um, slave population density in 1860. (laughs) It was a map that was th- that really that. existed that showed like where were all the slaves, yeah. you know, and where were they most yeah. heavily concentrated, yeah. and it's just so interesting. Lincoln was looking at that, but he was also clearly looking at um, the military progress of the war. Yeah. Um, yeah. In Virginia, he was. Um, I don't know if you want to hear this whole story. You've read it sure. in my book, but you know those counties around Fort Monroe. I mean, here they are. They're they're kind of where. All this started with those three original fugitive slaves. And then what happens is some of the union men in the region, because there were union slaveholders in that region, um, they get together and they hold a congressional election really quick, Mm -hmm. you know, in December 1865. Or maybe they had it in November, somewhere in November, December. And um, uh, a man named Joseph Seagar, who was a slave owner, he got himself quickly elected. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the indicators to Lincoln that this was now a loyal region mm-hmm. again, that they had a member of Congress, of mm-hmm. the U.S. Congress. Mm-hmm. And so it was very quickly done um, yeah. under some, you know, I don't know if they were the best electoral circumstances. I don't know what kind of good election it was. Yeah. But yeah. Um, but so then Lincoln quickly exempted those yeah. That congressional district yeah. Yeah. from the proclamation. You know, it always seemed to me that the emancipation uh, was really uh, the groundwork for it was really laid by the second confiscation act. Yeah, we sort of skipped over that. In yeah. July of 62, mm-hmm. which, um, I mean, uh, the Union Army could mm-hmm. take any and all property of people in rebellion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and any person committing treason, which they regard that because they say mm-hmm. you cannot secede. So mm-hmm. this is treason. They could be fined, imprisoned, or executed, and his slaves uh, freed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they've, they've got instructions to the army now uh-huh. to administer that. Right. Right. I mean, that's where really the first time it becomes clear that freedom is going to result. Yeah. From a union victory. But and and word got out about the Second Confiscation Act, um, but maybe not quite in the way that the Emancipation Proclamation yes. did. I mean, yeah. the Emancipation Proclamation had a force and a visibility and a political sort of force, I guess, to it. It did. That yeah. made people realize, okay, yeah. now the union's committed to freedom. Yeah. Now the un- the union is, the whole union is yes. committed to it. The executive branch and now the, the, yeah. the legislative Except branch. Except we're going to exempt the union parts of the slaveholding <laughs> yeah. region. Yeah, but, 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 but Lincoln, Lincoln says, but wait a minute, it's not everybody. It's yeah. people— Except those I've said you can't touch. Right, <laughs> right. right. Yeah. I mean, it's right. It's very detailed, very intricate, the proclamation <clears throat> is. Yeah. And all of this union policy has – it's very intricate and complicated. So um, it took in, me a long time to kind of sort it out in my mind, I have to say. And today, one of these uh, – uh, donate your money to to the uh, uh, law firm and they'll file all these lawsuits. Today, there would be a lawsuit filed against oh. the Emancipation Proclamation. Yes. Say it violates the Act of Congress. Right. And it would probably got a, you'd probably get an injunction against it. Yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> well, and, and so so here's why Lincoln was concerned about that, oh, and yeah. why the Thirteenth Amendment would become so oh, important. Oh, of course, to him. ultimately. Yeah. Ultimately, Although I'm skipping ahead. Would. <laughs> and, and interestingly, at the same time, they enact the uh, Second Confiscation Act. They act. They enact the Militia Act. Uh-huh. And tell the folks about that. Yeah. So here, you know, for a couple years, well, a little over a year now, we have um, African-American men who are laboring for the Union Army. Right. uh, Because that's what Butler originally allowed, and this is what's spreading. Um, But then the question becomes, well, what about actually serving Mm -hmm. in the Army Mm -hmm. and enlisting as a soldier? Mm -hmm. And so here, the Militia Act, for the first time, Makes that a lawful yeah. Um, thing. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, actual enlistments get a little, they're sort of slow to take off. And the Emancipation Proclamation, in a sense, reiterates that mm-hmm. um, and, um, you know, <clears throat> encourages and, um, you know, opens up the possibility yeah. of a black man enlisting. It's, it's interesting. The first Confiscation Act somewhat finally uh, uh, enacts things that Butler. Mm-hmm. insisted upon. Mm-hmm. The second one enacts things Fremont insisted yeah. upon. Yeah. So here you've got two generals in the field who most mm-hmm. people don't know a whole lot of. They mm-hmm. know about John C. Fremont in California, but uh-huh. not as a not as Civil War service much. Yeah. Um, but here you have two commanders in the field mm-hmm. who have really made a difference mm-hmm. um, yes. in um, how you deal with this. Yes. And wouldn't it be correct to say that they're doing this because of the sheer volume of people? Oh, yes. Coming, they're reacting. Who are coming into yes. their jurisdiction. They didn't yeah. invite this. No. They didn't ask for it. And not just those two, but others expressed a real reluctance yeah. at times to even take this on. Yeah. They've got a war to fight. Yeah. You know, yeah. so they are reacting to huge numbers of people, tens of thousands. Yeah. The best estimate right now is at least 500,000. The whole war ran away from slavery. Yeah. It's possible it was more. I don't know. But yeah. um, but I think it's so interesting how this kind of comes up from the military situation. You know, I mean, there are some historians out there who want to argue that this was Lincoln's master plan, mm-hmm. you know, from even before the war. Mm-hmm. And I just don't buy it. No, I wouldn't either. When you get into... No, he seems you, reactive. Yes. Very reactive. Yes. And this, when you start, like, really getting into the policies and when they, they come up, I mean, it's very improvised and slowly building. And you yeah. can really see that. I, yeah. I don't see this as anybody's vision. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, and it's very military directed. Yeah, and he's very lawyerish, plotting uh-huh. type. Uh-huh. Most, most, frankly, most good lawyers are. And he was a pretty good lawyer. Yeah. What he does is he's always concerned about whether he's correct mm-hmm. or not, mm-hmm. and that this is going to take a long time. Mm-hmm. Echoing, by the way, a lot of his southern brethren uh-huh. who disfavored slavery, but uh, but understood mm-hmm. it's going to take a long time. The gradual. Guys, and of course, yeah. he is a product of that mm-hmm. same deal, yeah. I mean, in many, many ways. And and his ideas uh, about it are very Southern. Mm-hmm. What do you think about it? Well, I mean, even his support for a while of colonization, yeah. of, well, yeah. maybe the answer is to resettle yeah. enslaved people yeah. in Liberia or Haiti. I mean, he held on to that. Into the middle of the war. Yeah, he did. So yeah, he did. that was very pretty yeah, southern of him. But he is clearly a reactor yeah. in this in this drama. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, in January of 63, the emancipation mm-hmm. is – the formal emancipation yeah. is, 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 is issued. Um, uh, did – once that was issued, uh-huh. do you find the landscape changing – much after January of 63? Not dramatically. Yeah. No. I mean, I think it um, it certainly clarified things in people's minds about the, what the union was going to be doing. But mm-hmm. in terms of on the ground, mm-hmm. not really. Yeah. Um, you know, people have been running away for a couple years now. There's not a sudden increase in the numbers uh-huh. that I could see. Yeah. Uh, maybe somebody will disprove me at some point. But um, it doesn't have a quick af- impact yeah. 
it's more just kind of changing the way people are thinking. Yeah. I think that's really what it yeah. does. Um, and it, I mean, and I don't mean to downplay the proclamation. I mean, that's pretty important. Um, and there's good reason why some of the African-American people in these camps and then all across even the North are holding celebrations yeah. for the proclamation. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, even in Norfolk mm -hmm. um, and around Hampton, exempt mm -hmm. from the proclamation, they hold a celebration. Yeah. So because they see kind of in the big picture what yeah. this is committed yeah. the union to do, and yeah. that's still important to people. But as far as day to dayness, it's just kind of it's the same sort of momentum yeah, continues to how build. I, it's, it, yeah, that's mm -hmm. that. That seems to be the way it is. The mm -hmm. way I I can uh, I find it uh, yeah. reading. Um, uh, but let's let's focus for a, a minute on Kentucky. Okay, for fun. Oh boy! Uh, but it's always now different we're in throw Kentucky. Now we a lot of chaos into this whole story that we very neatly laid yes. out. People said, "Gee, now there's a resolution to now this." Now I somehow. get it, and now here comes oh, Kentucky. Oh no! Oh no! You know, here here's Kentucky. Kentucky, of course, the slaves are not freed under the Emancipation right. Proclamation yet. The Second Confiscation Act makes it clear that maybe. Mm -hmm. You know, if uh, yeah, if they can distinguish, a, if a slave comes in in Kentucky into a camp and they can distinguish that this was truly a person from a Confederate owner, <laughs> then it would apply. But then, how do you, how do you, as an army official with this, you know, man who's come in, yeah, how do you know for sure who owned them? Yeah, you, you know. They didn't come with an identification yeah. card. Yeah. You, know, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's interesting. Uh, no, they don't. I mean, yeah. can I see your driver's license? Yeah. <laughs> so, of course, and this and this yeah. actually happens. You know, some of these officials say, I can't distinguish one from the other. I can't yeah. figure out who's from Confederate, who's from union owner. Yeah. You know, there, yeah. this whole idea of distinguishing between them makes no sense yeah. in a place like Kentucky. Yeah. 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 So you've, we've got this hideous ambiguity in yes. Kentucky. <laughs> Um, and, that's a and good title. It, yeah. <laughs> that should be an article. That's a, that's a, hideous ambiguity. Hideous ambigu Kentucky, Kentucky in the, the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got this 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 horrible uh, hideous ambiguity here in Kentucky. <laughs> um, but you know, uh, as the war progresses, mm -hmm. uh, 1862, 1863, Union armies are pressing mm -hmm. deeper and deeper into mm -hmm. the Confederacy. Yeah. Uh, Kentucky was overwhelmed in um, by the February 1862, uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, literally overwhelmed, uh -huh. and um, uh, it all became occupied by Union mm -hmm. troops. And uh, then those armies continued to move into Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, Tennessee was uh -huh. overwhelmed quickly. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, then the war really was w being waged in Mississippi, mm -hmm. um, some in Alabama, mm -hmm. and Georgia mm -hmm. in particular. Mm -hmm. And so all those slaves who lived in Tennessee mm -hmm. and um, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, mm -hmm. Georgia, mm -hmm. um, as the armies moved south, they the army wouldn't take care of them. Mm -hmm. Mostly, Sherman wanted nothing to do with them, nor did Grant. Yeah, yeah. and um, so what happens to them? Mm -hmm. Well, there are some, especially closer into the Mississippi River Valley, mm -hmm. um, so West Tennessee. Mm -hmm. um, Memphis actually becomes a big gathering point, um, where you've got thousands of people who are sort of flocking around mm -hmm. Memphis. Memphis. Um, I mean, yeah, you know, armies on the move. You know, this this is yeah. not – they don't want they to can't. see refugee slaves attached to them. No. Um, but when you start to see an army in place in a, like Memphis or mm -hmm. um, eventually mm -hmm. Nashville and, and so forth, then mm -hmm. uh, we start to see some big communities of refugees yeah. that are um, living there. And yeah. um, some are trying to go n farther north. Mm -hmm. into Missouri, actually, mm -hmm. and um, into Ohio. And that raises all sorts of questions for the Union, too, when some of these northern governors start to think, wait a second, yeah. Yeah. are we going to start seeing a huge influx yeah. of former yeah. slaves? Yeah. And they're not yeah. keen on that. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, 
we've talked about this before, but um, when um, um, after the um, sec the, the the emancipation was issued mm -hmm. in uh, uh, January, mm -hmm. a um, newspaper in Frankfurt, the Kentucky um, Tri Weekly, mm -hmm. um, editorialized mm -hmm. that um, Kentucky shouldn't allow the emancipation to. Uh, mm -hmm to uh, be in force here, mm -hmm. nullify it, mm -hmm. uh, because all this is going to do is create refugees. Mm -hmm. And indeed, the state legislature nullified mm -hmm. the Emancipation yeah. Proclamation, even though it was Whatever a pro-union legislature. Exactly. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> Only in yeah. Kentucky is yeah. mine. It yeah. makes your head spin. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, so here's here's Kentucky obviously mm -hmm. dreadfully scared mm -hmm. of this influx of refugees. Mm -hmm. And um, so you get refugees coming into Kentucky from Tennessee and mm -hmm. Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, the emancipation treats basically, they're, they're technically free. They're technically free, yes. <laughs> the, which is The slaves in Kentucky. <laughs> which is, and at some point in some camps like Camp Nelson, there's like, well, if they're from another place, we can let them in, you know. But if they're from Kentucky, See, we go. can't. Right. And then, then there again, how do you distinguish? How do you, distinguish? How do you really know? Yeah. yeah. So it's just chaos. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there are there are, there are diaries of people here in Lexington. Mm -hmm. uh, the Peters. Gal oh, Francis Peter. Francis. She uh -huh. was a d delightful diary. Yes. But she records, you know, the road to Richmond, mm -hmm. now U.S. 25, mm -hmm. clogged mm -hmm. with refugees, mm -hmm. uh, white and black, by mm -hmm. the way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we forget that, you know, you've got a refugee problem of immense proportions yes. in this war. And, yeah. Uh, and that's, an, that's even another subject. That it is. That, that yeah. needs to be explored. Yeah. But um, uh, here you have them all pouring in here. Mm -hmm. And what do you do? Mm -hmm. What do you do with them? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Well, you know, you write ably about how many of the uh, military uh, camps, uh, they found refuge in lots of them. Mm -hmm. And you record that uh, some uh, 300 different camps were established for slaves. Yeah. And those, there are more. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, those are oh, the ones I'm sure I've, are. I've documented. Yeah, yeah, and they I'm range sure. from those that maybe were around for a few weeks and then had to uproot and evacuate yeah. to those that were around for almost four years. Yeah. yeah. And they ranged all the way up and down the Mississippi River. That's the really heaviest concentration, yeah. which makes sense because sure. if you go back and look at Lincoln's map of the slave mm -hmm. population, it was most heavily concentrated sure. in that cotton-growing region. Well, absolutely. And, yeah. of course, as even though Grant did not welcome them anywhere mm -hmm. around the army of the Tennessee, his, uh -huh. his army, mm -hmm. nevertheless, as Grant moved farther south, mm -hmm. uh, uh, occupational troops— Follow them mm -hmm. into all those towns, yeah, in Mississippi, yeah, uh, simply to keep the peace. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. um, uh, so you see in a map you have them these camps dotted all along the banks yeah. of the Mississippi River, from, and in the middle of the river on islands too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you imagine? Oh, can you imagine? Can you imagine? Uh. Um, well, you know, uh, we have, as many of our listeners know, um, Camp Nelson here mm -hmm. in central mm -hmm. Kentucky. Uh huh. Um, just this side, on this side of the Kentucky River in uh, Chesapeake County. That's right. And um, that camp was started uh, mid war, 1863 mm -hmm. and 64 and 65. I mean, there were 90,000 troops. Yeah. At yeah. one point in time or another, yeah. it, it's mind-boggling. I, I know you go out there today, and it's you know beautiful, empty land. Yeah. It's beautiful, but imagine yeah. all those men on that land. Yeah, it looked a lot different. I remember years ago, I, me and a friend went out there uh, with a metal detector. This uh -huh. is years ago. We were kids, uh -huh. and we went up to the farmer who mm -hmm. owned it, and I think his name was Asbury. Mm. And we asked him, "Can we?" use this on your property? He goes, oh, sure, Sonny. You know, you know, there's a there's a there's probably a good spot right over there. He was pointing to a spot where there was a, um, 
uh, like a, a, the provo, provost marshals where prisoners of war were kept. Mm -hmm. And we were messing around over there and buttons came up. Wow. And, uh, um, I mean, that place is enormous. Mm -hmm. and, and it's such a treasure today, It is too. a treasure. And, yeah. of course, now it's part of the National Park System, yes. which is really rather exciting. It and, is. Um, but um, there were more than 500 slaves that poured into that camp, and they mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. built a village for yeah, them. Yeah, and eventually there were thousands. Thousands, Towards yeah. the end. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they did. But, you know, it was, again, a slow and gradual process. <laughs> right. And it occurred in a very different way of every other place because of Kentucky's union uh, stance. Mm -hmm. And um, it really doesn't take off until 1864, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. really first with the enlistment of black men. And then after a great deal of, um, you know, it's minimizing it to say unfortunate events, but expulsions of women and children, which were yeah. – Really pretty traumatic. Um, it wasn't until um, early 1865, really December, January 18, December 64, January 65, that uh, finally women and children could mm -hmm. come into. So that's very late in the war. Um, yeah, there's that story of General Speed Fry, yeah. who was commander of that, uh, who was a you know well known yeah. man from from uh, Kentucky who. Mm -hmm. Um, was the commandant of Camp Nelson. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, he's the one who ordered all the women and children out. Right. And um, so many of them died. Yes. Of exposure. Especially the, the one expulsion in November 64. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. this involved the uh, Joseph Miller family. Right. Tell yeah. the yeah. listeners oh. about that. It's the saddest, saddest story. So, I mean, there's over 400 women and children who are taken outside in the camp. It's 17 degrees out mm. um, that night. And they have they find an empty meeting house and they have like one fire they can keep warm. They don't have food. And so um, a little boy dies that mm -hmm. night. And eventually other people die as well. But the men... The sol who were soldiers, mm -hmm. the husbands, the fathers, mm -hmm. were back at Camp Nelson wondering, what's happened to my family? And so some of them start walking out of the camp to go find mm -hmm. their families, and um, they do. And one was Joseph Miller, who was in the 124th USCT, and um, he found his family, and it was his son who had died. Um, his young son, and um, he he went back to the camp, and then he came back the next day to bury his son. Eighteen miles. Yes. He walk. Yes, in this cold and cold to bury his and son. And he's just distraught. And um, but fortunately, there were some sympathetic Union officials in Camp Nelson who did were not on board with expelling the women mm -hmm. and children. And what they do is they realize the power of stories and getting accounts of what happened. So they start taking depositions from Joseph Miller and from some other men who had gone looking for their families. Mm -hmm. And each of these men tell a firsthand story. And <sighs> um, it was actually the quartermaster at Camp Nelson mm -hmm. who took these stories and started sending them to members of the Senate in Washington, mm -hmm. members of Congress, to the newspapers, mm -hmm. and publicized this. He knew the power of the press, basically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, fortunately, he did because it put enormous public spotlight on what Speed Smith Fry had done. Mm -hmm. And so many people in the union said, no, we cannot be an army fighting for freedom and we're letting the wives and children of our soldiers die, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and so that was a really pivotal moment. And yeah. um, Congress passed a new law that guaranteed that any wife and child of a soldier would be treated as free yeah. and could come into camp. Wow. So that makes Camp Nelson a really significant place um, mm -hmm. for yet that other ne next step in union policy, really pushing along yeah, emancipation. Yeah. It happened because of Camp Nelson. Camp Nelson, yeah. he uh, Miller, he buried that first boy who died mm -hmm. was seven years old. <sighs> Imagine walking 18 miles back just to bury him. Oh. Then Joe Jr. died, mm -hmm. his son. Yeah. Then uh, his wife, Isabella, died. Right. Then Maria died. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then Calvin died. The entire family. And then, then he Joseph died. died. Then Joe died. And he is buried over in the National Cemetery at Camp Nelson. You can go see his headstone. 
it's just incredible. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. It's, it's heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And um, and a lot of it created by this ambiguity yeah. as to what, where, what yeah. do we do? Yeah. What are our right, right, right. right. Which is why I think for a long time we've seen the Emancipation Proclamation as the the big clear cut moment. Yeah, you know, overnight everybody was free, but these are the stories that tell us just how much it had to be really sort of fought for and how hard it was to yeah. achieve. Yeah, yeah, you refer to it as the long emancipation. Yeah, which mm-hmm. of course is what it is. Yeah, and it could be said it's still going on for many yeah. peoples. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, one of the things I, 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 I really you 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 made a a, a, a comment um, that um, uh, we've talked a lot about laws and uh-huh. proclamations uh-huh. and government this and military that, but the real ones who should be who struggled and mm-hmm. should be given credit. Mm-hmm. For emancipation, mm-hmm. are the African American mm-hmm. slaves who sought freedom? Yes, that they did it in so big a numbers yeah. that mm-hmm. it constantly put mm-hmm. pressure mm-hmm. until ultimately it happened. Yes, and you know it's like um, folks remembering their war dead. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We all talk about that. I mean. Um, our monuments around talk to mm-hmm. the war dead. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't build enough monuments to these war dead. Right. Just like in many ways, you can't build enough monuments to those who mm-hmm. law, who are lost in battle. Right. Um, but here is is a story that we are just starting to tell, mm-hmm. aren't we? Mm-hmm. You're the you're on the cutting edge of this. We are, and um, but interestingly, as I was working on this book over that decade, I started learning about people in local communities where these camps were, mm-hmm. who have been working to try to get the story out of their local history. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so around Fort Monroe in Helena, Arkansas, um, Mitchellville, South Carolina, there's some really great you know, descendants Mm -hmm. of some of these people, um, local historians who um, are succeeding, whether it's putting up a monument or in Helena, Arkansas, they've created a whole park Mm -hmm. where the refugee camps once stood. Mm -hmm. Um, Others have helped push to, you know, get Fort Monroe to be a national monument. So um, I feel like I'm part of something a little bit bigger right now. Well, to, you are. Yeah, you are. to you, to get a, this history out there. Yeah, but you're 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 really advancing the ball. <laughs> in, in fact, I hope I mean, so. You no, know, I don't think there's any question. And you've you've um, um, you have moved the ball uh, mm. significantly mm. Um, in the publication of this book. Oh, and, well, I um, hope so. Thank you. Well, thank you. Mm-hmm. And um, Amy, uh, have a final thought. I just think that you summed it up really well just then, that this was something pushed for and um, there is a whole story and a group of people who were part of this war that we have to really begin to see more clearly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I appreciate, you know, the opportunity to be here and talk about it. It's just terrific to have you. And um, uh, I'm so glad uh, you're here in in Lexington. Oh, I um, love it. Uh, it's a it's a nice place. It is a nice place. It's a nice place to be. Yeah. And while working on the book, it was near Camp Nelson, so that was especially <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, I'm sure glad Camp Nelson is in the hands it's in, and mm-hmm. it's um. Yeah. And by the way, there's a case where local people started. Yes. That. Yes. Oh, that's. I mean, um, the the folks in Jeff Jeff uh, Jessamine County just I did extraordinary them work years ago. Yeah, I mean, and then incorporated the honor guard that uh, oh. and got the tax numbers yeah. for them. I mean, years ago. Yeah. But uh, no, those kind of things mm-hmm. you love doing. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Um, so again, thank you for being here. It's been great thank fun. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. All right. Thanks. Become an American hero who participates in our mission by joining us at witnessinghistory.org. 
Download our documentaries and free teacher education materials that conform to grade level education standards at pbslearning.org. Follow Witnessing History on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn.